Independent Jewish homeland was to be created in the land of Israel. Prepare this land for homeland for the Jews, but they betrayed us. As in 1920, the cry went up, the government is with us, killed the Jews. I was struck by the poverty of honor that existed in, in just so much of the world. It was an appointment that would later come back to haunt the British. Criminals led nations into war and turned simple people into monstrous tools of destruction. The promised homeland in Israel could have accepted the Jews of Europe, but Great Britain reneged on their forsaken promise. Shalom and welcome again to Crosstalk. My name is Randy Weiss, and we're in a special series produced in collaboration with the Hatikva Film Trust. Today's program is based on a powerful documentary called The Forsaken Promise. In it, the story of the founding of the modern nation of Israel is revealed. As we learned last week, there is a strong evangelical Christian foundation, a fingerprint on the handiwork of God in the formation of the Jewish homeland. The Turkish Empire controlled the land of Israel during World War I. The British, Australians, and even the New Zealanders were all involved in bringing deliverance to the region. The Anzacs, as they were known, mounted a brilliant cavalry attack that is regarded as one of the most impressive in military history. Modern Israel came into existence through bloody battles and fierce fighting spanning several decades. And in today's episode, we will see just how God used His servants, even in the time of brutal world war, to bring about His plan for an independent Jewish nation. Join us now as we pursue the investigation underway in the Forsaken Promise, courtesy of our friends at the Hatikva Film Trust. Copies of the DVD of this series and the individual film DVDs are available at our website. And now, enjoy The Forsaken Promise. In 1917, the Allied armies swept across the Sinai Peninsula into the Negev to oust the Turks from Palestine. On October 31st, the Anzac Light Horse captured Beersheba, which opened the way for the Allies to take Jerusalem. On that very same day, the British Prime Minister David Lloyd George and Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour were in a cabinet meeting in London to formulate government policy for a Jewish national home in Palestine. The resulting Balfour Declaration was published two days later. It was providential, I believe it was God's providence and interaction, his sovereignty, that Balfour and Lloyd George were in those senior positions right at that crucial time. As I researched the subject, I realized the Balfour Declaration was written by only 10 men, the 10 men of the War Cabinet. And as I took a closer look at the lives of these 10 men, I realized that seven out of the 10 were from evangelical Christian backgrounds. And these men tended to be quite Zionistic. Yeah, isn't it amazing that Lloyd George and Balfour come in right at the very time when our troops are moving across the Sinai, spearheaded by the Anzac horsemen, men on the, on the field that could actually do what was needed. So you had these two incredible things happening together at the same time. If you had one without the other, well, it could have been a different ball game. But both those things came together. You had Weizmann already being known amongst the, um, the British uh, establishment. So the third component coming in. So there are three things just fitting in together beautifully at the same time. Another year, earlier or later, you might have only had one or two of those components and it wouldn't have, wouldn't have worked. So, you know, I think it was a miracle. Honestly, I think it was a miracle that it happened, that God brought those things together. But I think it was at, at the tail end of that evangelical interest in the restoration of Israel. A further six weeks of fighting against fierce Turkish resistance brought the Allies to the outskirts of Jerusalem. On the eve of the Feast of Hanukkah in the Jewish calendar, another miracle took place. The Royal Flying Corps took to the skies above the Holy City 
and dropped leaflets signed by General Allenby calling on the Turks to surrender the city. Allenby's name in Arabic, Al-Nebi, means the prophet. Consequently, the Turks surrendered the ancient city of Jerusalem without a shot being fired. I was always interested what was going on. I was only six years old when I went downstairs and I saw people standing on either side of Yafo Street. And I asked them, why are you standing here? And they said, Lord Allenby is coming down and we want to welcome him. And before long, I could see the horse coming down Jaffa Street. And everybody was so wild with excitement, we thought that Messiah was coming. This was our thought. Anyhow, he rode all the way and he went as far as the, the, the Jaffa gate is and dismounted and walked into the old city. Jerusalem was surrendered without a shot being fired. Who could have imagined such a miracle? On December 11th, 1917, one might have thought a Messiah had come to redeem the city of Jerusalem. And when General Allenby entered the old city through the Jaffa Gate, he might as well have been led by the hand of God. By the time Chaim Weitzman arrived in 1918, it should have been to receive a free, independent Jewish state. Had Britain honored her commitment to Weizmann through Prime Minister Lloyd George and, and Lord Balfour, Israel might have been created much sooner. Please stay tuned. We will soon see the ugly truth of the forsaken promise. Without any consideration, without any feeling and uh, so it went all over the, the city. They attacked all the Jewish homes and as I said with a cruelty unbelievable. The British betrayed us. The British authorities responded by ethnically cleansing Hebron of its Jewish population. The Jews had been stripped of their civil rights and declared as a subhuman race. Millions perished because of the world's inaction. No nation on earth would welcome the Jews. The promised homeland in Israel could have accepted the Jews of Europe, but Great Britain reneged on their forsaken promise. And I will bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. If you're like me, You've probably heard that scripture since you were young. But one might ask, what does this really look like? Well, there are two ways that you can bless Israel in a very tangible way. One of those ways is to go. The other way is to plant trees. You see, Israel is a modern miracle in the desert of the Middle East because believers like us plant trees. So I'll ask, do you want to bless Israel? For every $25 contribution that you make, we're going to plant a tree in your name and we'll send you a certificate that you can hang on the wall and display proudly that you're standing with and you have blessed Israel. So give me a call at 1-800-688-3422 or visit us on the web at crosstalk.org. Let us know how many trees you want to plant. And if you're able, join us on our next tour of the Holy Land and plant one with your own hand. Israel was ripe for habitation as an independent Jewish nation. But forces of evil fueled by anti-Semitic hatred came into play very quickly to delay 
the forsaken promise. The entrance of General Allenby and the forces from the Egyptian Expeditionary Force into Jerusalem on the 11th of December 1917 was in effect the culmination of the Restorationist dream, that dream which had been relevant within British Christian circles especially, but also in other countries for several hundred years, the dream of the return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel. And so the coming of General Allenby here in 1917 really was the fulfillment uh, of much of that expectation from the previous few hundred years. In 1918, Chaim Weizmann, the leader of the Zionist organization, who would one day become the first president of Israel, came to Palestine to further the Zionist cause. He arrived in Jerusalem to a tumultuous welcome from the Jewish population. However, he found that the British military administration was less than enthusiastic. The British had control over lots of Muslim people at that stage. The British administration that was here in place by then wasn't sympathetic at all. A lot of those guys had earned their stripes, you might say, in Arab areas uh, as administrators. So they came up and they began to fill these positions. So just imagine the Zionist organization coming in saying, well, we've been given this promise by the government that this will be a Jewish homeland. And they're sort of thinking, never heard that. Or if they had heard it, they didn't want to acknowledge it. They didn't see it as their obligation uh, to proclaim or publicize uh, British government policy as expressed in the Balfour Declaration. And that was intentional. The British, de the British decided, or the British military government decided that was a political issue for which they weren't prepared to get involved. In case you missed the explanation in our introductory episode, Permit me to remind our friends that the Balfour Declaration was the basis upon which an independent Jewish homeland was to be created in the land of Israel. This document, drafted in 1917, was not produced in a political vacuum. No, it was the result of promises made to Chaim Weizmann, a great Jewish chemist. By 1916, England was on the verge of losing World War I. The Germans had blocked the shipping lanes with their powerful fleet of submarines. The supplies of acetone needed by the English for the creation of gunpowder were totally exhausted. Great Britain was literally going to run out of ammunition and succumb to the German forces. But Chaim Weizmann invented a new technique for making the necessary component to keep England supplied with gunpowder in spite of the, the German blockade. The promise of a Jewish homeland was the reward granted to Weizmann by the Prime Minister of Great Britain for saving England from the wrath of Germany. But as we will see, when the forsaken promise was again delayed, other failed avenues were pursued to seek freedom. But despite the lack of enthusiasm on the part of the military administration, Weizmann met with the Emir Faisal of the Arab Kingdom of Hejaz. An agreement was entered into acknowledging the racial kinship that exists between the Arabs and the Jews and encouraging Jewish immigrants to settle in Palestine on a large scale and as quickly as possible. Faisal added a proviso to the agreement in his own handwriting Provided the Arabs gain their independence, else I shall not consider myself bound by one word of this agreement. Notwithstanding the formation of a number of independent Arab states, this agreement was later to prove worthless. Right from the start, it was obvious, right to, uh, both to the Arabs and the Jews, that the British administration was anti-Zionist and strongly against uh, the return of the Jews. And from that time on, there wasn't uh, either a military governor or later on, apart from Sir Herbert Samuel, there wasn't even a civil governor who wasn't tainted with anti-Semitism. In April 1920, Britain and France met with the League of Nations in San Remo, Italy, to obtain a mandate to rule over the former Ottoman Empire in the Middle East. 
Meanwhile, in Jerusalem, the governor's chief of staff enlisted the help of a well-known Arab agitator in an attempt to sabotage the outcome of the San Remo conference. Colonel Walters Taylor met with uh, uh, El Husseini, El uh, Haj El Amin, and he told him, and this is a quote, that he had a great opportunity to show the world that Zionism uh, was unpopular, not only with uh, the Palestine administration, but also in Whitehall. That uh, wasn't true, actually. And uh, he said that if disturbances of sufficient violence took place over Easter, uh, then both General Bowles and General Allenby would advocate the abandonment of the Jewish national home. With the Jewish police disarmed on the orders of the administration and a cordon around the old city to prevent outside help, the riots started with cries of, we shall drink the blood of the Jews. Don't be afraid, the government is with us. The Jewish quarter was ransacked and several people killed. However, Zaev Jabotinsky, who had fought with distinction in the British army during World War I, managed to break through the police cordon to quell the bloodshed. Jabotinsky uh, and his uh, self-defense boys were locked up in jail. Abbot Jabotinsky was sentenced to 15 years imprisonment. And the only reason why he didn't serve that term was because there was a, an uproar uh, which was absolutely unprecedented. Hajamin was given a five-year sentence for his overt role in the pogrom, but he escaped in mysterious circumstances. A pattern had been set that would haunt the rest of British rule over Palestine. Sir Herbert Samuel was appointed as the first High Commissioner of Palestine. The Jewish community was overjoyed by his appointment. The Arabs were less than happy and so were some members of the British administration. It's reported that one of the staff of the British civil administration said, and there I was at Government House and a huge Union Jack flying and underneath it sat a bloody Jew. And so it was that a Jewish Zionist from England was placed in authority over what would be a Jewish homeland. Not everyone was happy, but a path to freedom was in sight. Stay tuned for more of The Forsaken Promise. Without any consideration, without any feeling. And uh, so it went all over the, the city. They attacked all the Jewish homes, and as I said, with a cruelty unbelievable. The British betrayed us. The British authorities responded by ethnically cleansing Hebron of its Jewish population. The Jews had been stripped of their civil rights and declared as a subhuman race. Millions perished because of the world's inaction. No nation on earth would welcome the Jews. The promised homeland in Israel could have accepted the Jews of Europe. But Great Britain reneged on their forsaken promise. And I will bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. If you're like me, you've probably heard that scripture since you were young. But one might ask, what does this really look like? Well, there are two ways that you can bless Israel in a very tangible way. One of those ways is to go. The other way, is to plant trees. You see, Israel is a modern miracle in the desert of the Middle East because believers like us plant trees. So I'll ask, do you want to bless Israel? For every $25 contribution that you make, we're going to plant a tree in your name and we'll send you a certificate that you can hang on the wall and display proudly that you're standing with and you have blessed Israel. So give me a call at 1-800-688-3422 or visit us on the web at crosstalk.org. Let us know how many trees you want to plant. And if you're able, join us on our next tour of the Holy Land and plant one with your own hand. 
Decisions have far-reaching effects. Sometimes what seems like a good idea turns out to be devastatingly bad. Such was the case when England appeased the Arab population of Jerusalem. As we will see, it led to more deadly delays in the forsaken promise. It's reported that one of the staff of the British Civil Administration said, and there I was at Government House and a huge Union Jack flying and underneath it sat a bloody Jew. The San Remo Conference of April 1920 had awarded Britain the mandate to govern Palestine. This gave the Balfour Declaration official status. The Balfour Declaration was implemented by its incorporation virtually word for word in the mandate. Now, the mandate is a document, uh, you might call it an international agreement between uh, the League of Nations on the one part and Britain on the other, in which uh, Britain undertook towards the League of Nations that it would administer, administer Palestine in accordance with the terms of the mandate. The colonial office was given this responsibility. The colonial secretary at that time was Winston Churchill. Although Churchill was always a strong advocate for the Jewish national home, Sometimes his actions suggested otherwise. One of his first actions was to introduce a white paper dividing Palestine down the Jordan River, which resulted in the formation of a separate Arab homeland called Transjordan under the administration of the Hashemite Emir Abdullah. The effect of it was that no Jewish settlement was permitted in Transjordan, and that accounted for about 77% of the territory that was mandated to Britain by the League of Nations. So as a result, you have 77, 78% of the territory which could have been used for Jewish settlement was restricted and was primarily intended for Arab settlement. And in fact, uh, Kirk Bride, who was the British resident at the time, mentions in his book that it had been the intention to have a population transfer of the Arabs from west, from the west of the Jordan to the east of the Jordan, but that never took place. Sir Herbert Samuel, the British governor of what remained of Palestine, attempted to involve both Arabs and Jews in government. However, all his attempts failed. Because he was a Jew, Sir Herbert Samuel, uh, fell over backwards in order to try and be uh, even-handed. And one of the first things he did was to recall Hajj el-Amin. Uh, because he had a certain following, uh, Sir Herbert Samuel decided that if, if he was given responsibility, this would probably sober him up. Hajj Amin was pardoned for his earlier transgressions and appointed the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem which gave him control over the Islamic religious hierarchy in Palestine. It was an appointment that would later come back to haunt the British. Yes, England's appeasement elevated an avowed enemy of the Jews. Sir Herbert Samuel was well-intentioned, but poorly served by promoting Haj Amin al-Husseini into the position of the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. Later, he became one of the leading supporters of Hitler's final solution to the Jewish problem. What might be an unexpected outcome was the influence the Mufti had on one of the best-known later enemies of Israeli sovereignty. Yasser Arafat is believed by many to be a nephew of the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. Though some doubt this, Arafat certainly followed in his mentor's twisted footsteps. And now, we must turn to the tragic pogroms of 1929. This too is part of the painful story of the Forsaken Promise. In 1929, the Holy Land was once again rocked with violence and the worst pogrom since the time of the Crusades. The only place almost in the whole country that was very quiet and very 
good relationship was in Hebron. Uh, the, the Jewish community lived with the Arabs. There was a business connection, there was a, a friendship, there was a, a, even uh, the invite, invitations to weddings and to, to uh, everything that life uh, offers. In 1929, the tranquility of the world's oldest Jewish community was shattered by the worst pogrom of the British mandate. All the um, uh, leaders of the community, the, the, my father, the Ashkenazi Rav, and uh, uh, Sfaradi Rav, and uh, my brother, all went to the governor to ask for protection. And when uh, he told them, go back and to your people and see that everybody stays home. And if they stay home, nothing will happen to them. Once again, as in uh, 1920, the cry went up, the government is with us, killed the Jews. And the government simply did nothing. And you didn't see on, on the whole time, not a, a policeman, not a, a responsible person, nobody, nobody. The, the crowd was, incited crowd, was free to do whatever they, they planned. And one of the first houses that they attacked was my brother's house. And the result was very tragic. And it was a dreadful tragedy. The story of these pogroms will be continued in our next episode. I must warn you that some images may be too disturbing to be viewed by young children. When we meet again, we will continue our study of the forsaken promise and the establishment of the modern nation of Israel. This project was made possible through the kindness of the Hatikva Film Trust. DVDs of this entire series, along with the film itself, The Forsaken Promise, are available through our website, www.crosstalk.org, or by calling the number on the screen. Till next time, remember to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and for the eternal salvation of my people. As Christians, we share a debt owed to the people of God. As His servants, we must reach out in faith and have a ready answer for the reason of our hope. My hope is in Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. And so it is for all of us at Crosstalk International and the Hatikva Film Trust. Shalom and God bless you. Because he loves me, I will follow him. Because he loves me, because he loves me. Because he loves me, I will follow him. Because he loves me, I will follow him.